Recently, SpongeBob Lights Camera Pants turned 10 years old. Like most popular franchises that delved into video games, SpongeBob wasn't about to shy away from the concept of party games, and Lights Camera Pants actually took an original spin on the often repetitive and overpopulated genre. You may remember the last time I reviewed a party... game. Instead of working off some type of board game or menu screen to vaguely justify the game's premise, Lights Camera Pants instead chose to give a full story behind the minigames you end up playing. The new Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy movie is being made, and they need to cast people as extras, but also the coveted role of the main villain, the Sneaky Hermit. So across eight different locations, four players could compete in sets of three minigames to see who got the role of each extra, and the player with the most points overall won the role of the Sneaky Hermit. And I think we can all agree that it is by far Nolan North's most iconic performance. I played this game a ton back when I was a kid. The story elements even made it fun to play in single player, when most of the time party games focus on the multiplayer, and the variety of collectibles and bonus challenges added replay value. But the bulk of the playtime was spent in the minigames, which by party game standards are longer than average, with the game's speed increasing as time goes on, giving enough time and points to allow a player who fell behind at the start to catch up by the end. But as fun as the game is, it certainly isn't the type of game you'd call... fair. Any of the 2 vs 2 minigames pairs players 1 and 2 together, and players 3 and 4 together, FOR THE WHOLE GAME! WHY? It doesn't matter how good you are at this game, getting stuck with a partner who doesn't know what they're doing is really gonna hurt your chances. And the controls aren't super responsive for some many games. Like how the control stick is sometimes delayed, causing you to move over one space too many- ARE YOU SERIOUS?! WHO ORDERS THREE SODAS?! That's f you FUCK YOU! YOU DIABETIC PIECE OF SHIT! So in honor of the game's 10th birthday, we're doing the Top 10 Lights Camera Pants minigames. I judge the minigames based on three qualities. Number one, are they broken slash do they control well? Number two, are they based on an original and interesting concept? And number three, do they require strategy or are they repetitive and simplistic? The only quality a minigame has to have to be on this list is the first one, since no game is gonna be fun if you can't control it well- OH MY GOD! But also, hey, it's a party game, so don't kill me if your favorite didn't make my list. Thanks, that would be great. I find that there are two main ways to make a minigame fun and engaging. You can build a new concept from the ground up and make it complex enough to be satisfying for a short period of time. Or you can take a previously established concept and dumb it down so it's simple enough to be enjoyed for a short period of time. Seahorse Stampede is the latter. It's soccer, on seahorses, in a jail, and it's fun. I used to practice this minigame a lot when I was younger, and I remember being really, really good at it, like upwards of 20 goals good. I replayed it recently and got three. The controls aren't amazing, and stealing the ball seems a bit too easy, causing a lot of chaotic back and forth on the field, but scoring a goal is still super satisfying. Assuming, of course, that you didn't score on yourself, but I think we all know that that never happened. Ever- no, shut up! The Bouncers minigame is perhaps the best example of how to take a predictable and simple idea and do totally nothing with it. Which is why it isn't on this list. Instead, take Flipping Out, a game based around flipping things around and catching them. See, what the bouncers did wrong was that it had no random elements. You could only move between three spaces, and the objects you had to bounce came in with the exact same pattern each time. And although Flipping Out shares the same three spaces element, the objects being bounced and caught move at the player's own pace. Teams of two work against each other to flip patties as fast as they can, while catching the patties their own partner just flipped. The game gets increasingly faster as the round goes on. Elements like the plankton patties ensure the players aren't mindlessly flipping and catching things, and having to decide between catching a patty and burning one makes players think on the fly. The fast pace is just fast enough to actually provide a bit of a challenge, and the random elements keep the minigame from becoming just another rhythm game. What I like about Jellyfish Jamboree more compared to Jellyfish Swish is that although the two games are based around netting jellyfish, Jellyfish Jamboree has much better controls and requires a little bit more strategy. Getting to move in three dimensions means players are less likely to bump into each other, and the actual act of catching the jellyfish isn't how you get points. The way you score points is by aiming your net and slingshotting the jellyfish into your unique target, so the act of netting a bunch of jellyfish doesn't actually guarantee you any points. Making the targets move and having a maximum net capacity of 5 means players have to decide between filling their net and potentially missing the target on its cycle, or shooting what they have in their net now and getting the target twice before it disappears off screen. Being risky with your angled shots may or may not pay off. Having different point values for jellyfish adds another layer of decision making too. Overall, just a simple and enjoyable minigame. Inflatable Pants deserves a spot on this list solely for giving Squidward a reason to wear pants, but it's also a fun, albeit janky game to play. You use one button to raise your character higher and higher into the air, and let go of the button to drop down slowly. It's a balancing act. 
You have the option to move left and right, but if your analog stick is in any position other than fully to the right, then you are playing this game wrong and it's like you don't even want to win. This is a race after all. Well, kind of. It's like a bunch of mini races stitched together, where the first player who passes a net gets the most points, and the other players get an increasingly lower amount. Two players who pass a net at the same time are ranked based on who is higher in the air. You have different net heights and trees to keep players from hanging out at the top of the screen the whole time, and you'll lose points if you aren't careful. It's chaotic, especially near the finish line, but it's fun nonetheless. Breaking Out is an effective variation of the type of minigame where you have to collect and transport a resource to exchange for points. The strategy here is collecting enough of the resource so that you can potentially earn a ton of points, but knowing that it's going to put you at a risk to transport so much of it. Loot Scootin' does pull this off for the most part, but it's a bit too random and sensitive to small mistakes to be very balanced. Breaking Out, on the other hand, involves putting prison inmates in a basket and avoiding searchlights to get them over to some trampolines. Even if you get spotted, you won't immediately suffer a penalty, giving you a few seconds to get rid of any prisoners you have on hand before landing yourself in a cell. The time penalty you suffer is long enough to make you actively avoid the searchlights, but short enough so as not to be tedious. Having three prisoner access points and not four adds a layer of micro-competition between the four players, and movement speed is fast enough so that you're only going to get spotted if you weren't paying attention or if you got too greedy. Charge is the kind of idea that works so well as a minigame that I feel it could be expanded to a larger scale if it was modified slightly. The goal of the game is to collect points by lighting up beacons with your own color. The beacons are positioned so that you can light up a series of triangular areas to greatly increase the number of points you earn. You can only charge a certain number of beacons at once, so you have to frequently go and recharge your character at stations. At first it's a mad dash to charge whatever beacon is closest to you, but soon players are fighting over so-called territories that they make in order to expand their colorful empire. Beacons in the center are the most popular, often being stolen back and forth between players, and that's because those beacons are key to lighting up big areas. You could stick to the outer beacons, but that's far less lucrative in the long run. Combine this with the time-sensitive nature of how much charge you have left, and you have a bunch of split-second decision-making going on. I can totally see this as the basis for a pretty hectic multiplayer RTS. Look, if you played this game before, chances are you knew this minigame was going to make the list. I mean, I even considered making it the number one spot until I actually looked critically at the game. Rock Bottom is a basic Guitar Hero clone, and for a rhythm game inside a bigger non-rhythm game, the controls are actually pretty satisfactory. Definitely not on the same level as actual Guitar Hero, but they manage. I remember playing this minigame to death as a kid, but from a pure gameplay standpoint, I'm honestly not quite sure why I liked it so much. I think it was more the fact that relative to every other minigame, it was the least repetitive. See, the mechanics were simple, but the real depth came from having the most replay value out of any of the games on this list, and that's because playing as different characters changes the button combinations and instruments you use during the song. Spongebob had a kick-ass guitar, Plankton rocked the piano, and Squidward played his clarinet, and that is totally a saxophone, that's not a clarinet, whatever, it still sounds good. Finally, a minigame where the character choice wasn't just a cosmetic difference. And I should also mention the amazing song for this game and the unique solos each character had, as well as how Messing Up actually removed that instrument from the music. This game is essentially a more interesting version of both Beats Me and Jig on the Brig, except it gives you both visual and audio cues instead of just one or the other. Now as much as I love the replayability of this minigame, that came at a cost. The developers actually made the maximum score you can get with each character different. If you and your friends all play perfect rounds, Squidward will always lose with 1000 points, Sandy will always win with 1,036 points, and every other character will tie with 1,008 points. This may or may not have bumped this minigame down a couple spots. Flinging and swinging has to be one of the most unique concepts in the entire game. Literally all you do is touch pegs to make them red, and that's it. The fun part is how you move between the pegs. You rotate, you swing, you fling, and you drop off the building because your partner is an idiot. Luckily, the time penalty is just the right length. You have a clear objective to grab all 100 pegs, and the controls are actually really simple, but getting the most air and going where you want to go is based all on the timing of your button presses. It's just so much fun. Florit is one of three minigames on this list that are basically very simplified versions of other games, and that's not a bad thing either. First you had Soccer, then you had Guitar Hero, and now Kart Racing. If Rock Bottom has the most replay value, then Florit has the most freedom. You have three courses, six, five, and three laps each, getting increasingly difficult. You can accelerate, brake, go on boost pads, and avoid oil slicks. If you want to go off-road, you can. 
If you want to cause a four car pileup, you can. My favorite part has to be using the brakes to pull off a ridiculous burnout finish. The controls are much looser than your standard Mario Kart, which is completely understandable. It's not supposed to be a game for speedrunning. The track isn't your biggest enemy, your opponents are. They'll spin you out and ram you into corners, which is made even more chaotic by the massive size of your car. And even if you get screwed over in one race, the game is judged based on the finish times and not positions, so it's pretty fair overall. And finally... Wait and see. Actually no! Fuck that game! Goo Ladiators! Goo Ladiators is the best minigame because it's simple while still strategic, it's competitive, it changes up the environment, and I am really, really good at it. The goal is to get points by spraying your unicycle riding opponents with goo. You can use a bunch of quick shots, not super strong but quick to pull off, or a charge shot essentially guaranteed to send your opponent flying, but something you have to plan ahead to use. In between the players are bumpers, which when hit can give bonuses, but are likely to result in at least one player falling off the sides. And finally we have the break button, the button that separates the losers from the champions. If someone's near the edge, go after them with a barrage of quick shots. If someone is near the center, use a charge shot to hit them into a bumper. Someone charging their gun? Better be ready with that break button. I love this minigame so much. And also, all of my friends are massive scrubs. This video was sponsored by I don't get paid for this .com in partnership with I should study for my exams. Great. Stay in school. Okay, hey, um, thank you for watching that video. That was super nice of you. You know what also helps? Uh, watching more of my videos. That would, that would be super cool. But I have exams right now, so once I'm done that, I'm going to work as hard as I can to get some stuff out. So that's cool. That's a, that's a goal. Um, so you can look forward to that. Um, anyway, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you later. And no! I'm not doing that!